In this video, I'm gonna show an example of how you can use a 3D printer at your local library to fix common household items when they break and do it at a very low cost. I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to 3D modeling or 3D printing, but my reason for making this video is to show you that you really don't need to be an expert to unlock the infinite potential of this technology. So I bought this waterproof pannier about two years ago and I've used it on several bike tours. For the most part, it's been working really well, but I recently noticed that one of these two clips which is used for holding the pannier onto the cargo rack, unfortunately it's had one of its tabs broken off. So despite the crack, it still seems to be functioning okay at the moment, but I'm concerned that if I keep using it like this, that it'll get worse over time, and the last thing that I want is for this to be broken when I'm out on a tour. So I've communicated with the manufacturer of this product, which is Giant, and they told me that my pannier is outside of their one year manufacturer's warranty and also that they don't sell any kind of replacement parts for it. This is disappointing considering I paid more than $100 for this and it's less than two years old. Nevertheless, after I looked at it more closely, I realized that this part should be pretty easy for me to model in 3D and I can print it using the 3D printer at my local library for a very low cost. These clips are designed to be removable from the pannier, so I'll take them off to start my work. Each clip is held together with a slotted spring pin and I'm using a small nail to push the pin out. With the pin removed I can get a much better look at the broken part. I'm using the seam ripper tool to cut the threads which fasten this part to the pull strap. I can now use my vernier calipers to take accurate measurements of the part. In this case since the profile of the part is kind of abnormal I decided to use my scanner to help me replicate the shape of it on the computer. If I didn't have a scanner, I would have just approximated the shapes as best I could by measurement. In order to give the 3D printer the information that it needs to print a replacement part for me, I need to create a 3D model. The software that I'm using to do that is called Fusion 360. As long as you're only using the software for personal use, you're entitled to a one year free subscription of the software. There are also computers at my local library which have the software already installed and ready to use. Teaching you how to use Fusion 360 is beyond the scope of this video, but there are plenty of great tutorials on YouTube which can teach you the basics. In the video description I've included a link to the tutorial that I used to learn the software. I still consider myself very much a beginner with respect to using this software, so it took me about two hours to model this fairly complex part, but with more practice you can get a lot faster at doing this. So now that I'm finished the model, I can export it from Fusion 360 into a format that the 3D printer software can interpret. The file type that I'm using is called STL, and it usually takes a while for it to render. After it's finished, I can open the file in a piece of software called Cura, which is from the company that makes the 3D printers that my library has. Cura is free to download, and it lets you experiment with some of the parameters before you print. For example, you can change the orientation of the part on the print bed. You also get to select what percentage of infill you want to include. In my case I'm printing something structural, so I want it to be solid plastic, but you also have the option of printing it so that the inside of the part is partially hollow. When you press the slice button at the bottom, it will give you an estimate of how long it will take to print and how many grams of material it's going to use. These two values are really useful to know because my library has a two hour limit on most of their printers and they charge you based on how many grams of material you use. If you find that the estimated time is longer than the amount of time that you're allowed, you can adjust some of the parameters to make it print faster, but at a lower level of precision. So after I've done a quick check of the part in Cura, I'm ready to take that file to the library to actually get it printed out. My library lets you make reservations ahead of time, and I've already made an appointment for tomorrow evening. So the next evening I headed over to the Toronto Reference Library, which is one of eight Toronto public libraries that offer 3D printing. The 3D printers are located within a section known as the Digital Innovation Hub, and the staff who work there are very friendly and helpful. After you arrive, you're assigned to a computer where you launch the Cura software and load your 3D model. Then one of the library employees transfers the printing instructions that the software generates onto an SD card, which they install into one of the printers, and the printing begins. The printer head extrudes a thin bead of molten plastic in the shape of your part onto the printing bed and stacks layer upon layer on top of each other. I decided to print my replacement part in the color black, but the library has an assortment of other colors that I could have chosen instead. While the printer is printing, you're free to leave the library if you'd like. Since I had about an hour to kill, 
I went and did some grocery shopping and then came back when it was almost finished. After the print is finished and the part is cooled down, the library staff puts it on a scale and weighs it and gives you the bill to pay. So my particular part weighed in at five grams and the price was a grand total of 57 cents. They only charge you 10 cents per gram plus tax, which is a very reasonable price in my opinion. So since the 3D printer started at the bottom layer and slowly worked its way up to the top layer, it added in this support structure in here, which supported this top part over here, which would otherwise be an overhang and there'd be nothing to support it. Usually this support material is pretty easy to remove, and I'm going to use this small slotted screwdriver to do it. After removing all the support material, I like to go over all the sharp edges with a small file. Alright, so now that I have all that support material removed, I can get a good look at it and see how well I did in terms of replicating the part. And if I do say so myself, I think I've done a really good job. They look really, really similar. Uh, one thing that I didn't replicate is I didn't add these ribs on the back here. Uh, one reason is because I figured, you know, it would take extra time to have to model those. And the uh, second reason is because if I had those there, there'd be more support material to remove and that would take, you know, additional time to clean up after the fact. And you know, the amount of extra plastic that's in there is pretty negligible, so I think, um, I think it doesn't really matter. So when I do a quick test, I can see that my new part is able to fit very nicely in the spot where it's supposed to go. So I can proceed with sewing this back onto the red strap. I'm just using a standard needle and thread and going back and forth across it a few times to make sure it'll be nice and strong. Once I'm finished that, I can reassemble the clip, this time including the little spring. As far as I can tell, the new part is functioning exactly the way that it's supposed to be. But for a true test, I've installed the clips back on the pannier and trying it on the bike, the clips engage correctly and they hold the panniers in place correctly and when I pull on the red strap, they release it correctly. So now I can celebrate my successful repair. So you might be tempted to suggest that I could have just glued this part back together again using something like epoxy. I probably could have, but even if I had done a really good job at this, the part never would have been as strong as it was when it was new. On that note, my philosophy with respect to fixing things is never to make something as good as new, but rather to make it better than new, because the reason why I'm fixing it is because the original design failed. In this case, when I modeled this part after the original, I made these two tabs so that they were slightly thicker to hopefully reduce the likelihood that one of them will break in the future. In reality though, I think the reason why the original clip got broken was because at some point when the pannier was fully loaded, it must have gotten picked up by this red strap here, as opposed to the black one. The red strap's only rated for 10 kilograms, because when you lift from that point, all the weight needs to be supported by those four little tabs. So as long as I'm careful in the future to only ever use the red strap for unlatching, and then use the black strap for lifting, my repair should last for a really long time. So I hope this video helped to demystify the world of 3D printing. It's surprisingly easy to do, and there are plenty of resources available for free to help you learn how to do it. 3D printers are becoming common at public libraries, so I encourage you to check your local library to see if they have them available yet. Even if they don't, there are plenty of other options for getting things 3D printed, most of which will probably be more expensive than what I paid at my library, but will still be considerably less expensive than buying a 3D printer of your own. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've ever used a 3D printer for making a replacement part for fixing something, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below, and thanks for watching.